I came to the United States when I was 11 months old. My mom was born in uh, Las Saivas, which is Turicato, Michoacan. It's a ranch, a small town, actually no, um, no, it was actually not even electricity, no nothing. It's, uh, it was just a little town. That's where she was born and raised with her. She's one of the youngest of 13. Um, from there, she left. She wanted the city life. City life being Guadalajara. Guadalajara is a big city. Her and a few cousins and some friends left Michoacan and went to Guadalajara, which was where I happened to be born. My mom wanted to come here for a better future. I mean, for myself, she thought about my sister and I. She, you know, I mean, she wanted to do something that would be beneficial for us, and she thought this would be a good place for us. And plus. Her siblings, older brothers and sisters were, had already came here, so she was like, fuck it. Myself, as far as memory, all I know was Sacramento, but I hear stories of people that were with me when we crossed, and we came here undocumented, illegally. So we crossed through the desert, um, through the desert, and hearing the stories of my family members telling me uh, what they, what was going on, how we got across, um, how when we got to uh, through the desert, and how everything was the water, no sleep. Uh, we actually ended up uh, arriving in San Diego, jumping on a public bus, and when we get there. Um, Everyone tried to act like we were asleep. Border Patrol goes on the bus, and we're all acting like we're asleep. Border Patrol wakes everybody up, because obviously we're not asleep. We, you, could tell, you can tell that we have just crossed through the desert. We were all dirty and all that, you know what I'm saying? They wake us up, and they bring our asses, they, they deport our asses back to TJ, leave us there. And at that point, my mom was, kind of hesitant about coming back. She ended up doing it again, get us through. Again, I was 11 months old. And these are all stories that my family was telling me. But these are all things that, for me, put so much pride in why, how hard it was for me to get here and how hard it was for me to be here that makes me, made me not want to ruin this opportunity I had to live in America. I just remember as a young kid, me and, four, five, six, seven, around that age, um, family members and people always talking about La Migra, right? So with time, I kind of understood what La Migra meant. They were very, um, not afraid, yeah, I guess you could say afraid of being caught by them. And they were always raiding houses in the neighborhoods or certain places where we would tend to hang out and just show up and take them. You know what I mean? And, and how was that and, as a young, a young man? Like a young boy. Man, boy. Yeah, I was a young boy. Young boy. Um, it was interesting because I didn't know anything. I didn't know what it was like. I thought it was normal. You know what I mean? That everyone was afraid of this. Everyone was terrified. Um, I imagine having an uncle there for dinner one day and the next day, he's nowhere to be found. You know what I'm saying? So. Now as an adult looking back, that is not normal. <laughs> but at the time as a six year old, five year old, I thought it was normal because everyone in my circle was like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, it was, it was at the time normal. To me it was at least. I didn't think anything else, even to the point for me that I even myself was afraid of La Migra, even though I had no idea what they were like or <laughs> what it was. And now I know La Migra is actually Border Patrol. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really understand it until I became a teenager. Until my first um, boxing tournament is when I realized that I was a part of that also because I wasn't able to participate in certain tournaments. And what I mean by that is I wasn't able to participate in open tournaments, national tournaments, state tournaments where you qualify for Olympics and things like that. That's when I finally realized what exactly it was. It was much bigger and it hit me much more harder because now it's stopping me from my dreams. 
as that five, six years old, I never realized it was going to stop my dreams. So I, we were at home all day, my sister and I. And when we were alone, we would eat whatever we had at home. Or we get left. Sometimes we're dropping off at our cousin's house, this house, because my mom was working all day. Um, throughout those times, I saw a lot of people treat me certain ways because I was kind of a, a kid with no future. There was opportunities where I had family members that could could have helped, that could have had, the, they had an opportunity to help me as far as becoming a citizen or anything like that. And they chose not to do it because they didn't know what my future would turn out to be. And things like that, conversations or hearing parents tell me don't hang out with that kid, that kid is bad, or, or parents look at me a certain way, give me dirty looks, um, uh, showing up to Halloween parties, to go trick-or-treating and I have no Halloween costume uh, showing up. And, and the weirdest one is going to bed and, and staying at someone else's house with their kids, their family, and seeing them get put to bed, get pajamas, and have a home, have an entire night routine. All these things that I had myself never thought it was affecting me as a young kid until as an adult, I really did see that all this stuff did affect me because it was always in my heart. I always realized that it did hurt me as a kid. And I carried that pain and that hurt in my heart, hating the world, because I always felt they were treating me. They were downplaying me because of who I was. My mother, when my sister and I, when I was crying, because I was, after getting my ass kicked by my sister, or getting my ass, something happened at home, uh, my mother would be the one I would cry to. I would literally grab her picture. Or I would grab anything of her, smell her shirt, and just cry to her. That was my way to cry to her because she wasn't home. I'm a mama's boy to the core, for yeah. real. Is there anything you want to say to your mom right now? Um, te quiero mucho. Tú sabes que sin ti yo no fuera el hombre que soy hoy, el día de hoy. Gracias, mami, por crear un hombre fuerte y enseñarme que que, tra que con trabajar duro todo se puede lograr. Y tú fuiste la que me enseñaste qué es trabajar y trabajar duro, diario, sin quejarse. Gracias, mami. I have an older sister, seven years older. My sister and I disliked each other. We, I mean, we fucking hated each other, bro. Uh, she had to take care of me, so we're at home. My mom was at work all day, every day, so we were alone. And while being alone, a teenage girl having to take care of her uh, hyperactive little brother, it was fights all the time. These scars are actually from her, the scars on my head. So we beat the crap out of each other. We hated each other, um, but now as adults, we actually, it just brought us together even more. I think a lot of the family members dislike me, not because necessarily because of me, it's just because I was a kid with a lot of energy, with no discipline. And we've all been around kids like that, no discipline, like, damn, I want to smack the shit out of this kid. That kid was me. That was a kid they wanted, everyone wanted to smack. <laughs> Shoot, I remember watching Trinidad and De La Hoya. I remember um, Vargas and De La Hoya. Um, and these are all fights I'm, they were on in my family. And I was always very big in fighting. I loved hurting people for some reason. I've always enjoyed hitting somebody, always enjoyed getting hit back, which is weird. I always enjoyed that. So my, my, my brother got me into it. My sister's husband was like, let's get you into boxing. And that's how, I, that's how boxing became that, that outlet for me. So when I first found out that I was unable to participate in certain amount, in X amount of tournaments or certain things I was unable to do because of my status, it kind of shattered my dreams because I felt like everything I was doing was pointless. And what I mean by pointless is I can't win any titles because I can't participate, so why am I going to box? I can't go to school and get a degree and get this because then I can't use that degree because I don't have a social, so why am I going to do that? So everything in my life became pointless, including boxing. I was still fighting and I was still training and I was still doing that, but it had no purpose. 
I was still going to school. I was still doing that, but I had no purpose. Purpose meaning I had no outcome. I was just doing it and doing it because I, I, I enjoyed boxing. And then school, to be real, I did it because I enjoyed the woman. You know what I mean? I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't necessarily because I like going to school. Um, so it, it, bro it broke my heart because I felt like if that wouldn't happen or if I had put a plan, my plans would have been different. I could have gone further with my boxing career if I would have had a team or somebody to guide me or guide somebody that was undocumented, but not that many people, or at least in my circle, knew what to do with an undocumented boxer. My, my lifestyle, everything for me was, I gave myself that excuse. I'm undocumented, I can't do nothing. I kept telling myself that, there's nothing I could do. So. I tend to, I, I begin to feel sorry for myself. I let myself do nothing with my life because I was undocumented and I couldn't do nothing. Um, so yeah, I didn't have no motivation. For a few years it was like that. It changed when I started working at the gym and I was starting to, and I, I was starting to be influenced by a lot of positive people, the members and things like that when I was 16 years old. I, at 16 I started becoming uh, I was starting to be around a lot of positive people and successful people that it changed my mindset. I had that loser mentality and that loser mentality became a winner's mentality when I was like, yo, I don't care that I'm undocumented. I'm going to make something happen out of it. And that's when I started pursuing boxing even harder again. That second win of boxing came and kicked back. That's when I started setting plans and turning professional, no longer Olympic plans. My plans would be like, I need to become a pro. Uh, that's when I started changing. I was like, yo, I need to pursue happiness, what's in my heart. And at the time I thought it was money. Thought if I made money, I would be happy. And that's why I decided to work on cars and change a career in, in cars, because it made a lot of money. And yeah, it made money, but it didn't make me happy. Yeah, 16 years old, I got offered a job to be a boxing trainer here in this gym. Angelo and Carrie offered me a position at Primetime Boxing to be a trainer when I was 16 years old. And that's, that experience itself just matured me so much at 16. And it changed me now. And that's something I will forever be grateful because without that, at that time, my mindset would probably never have changed and I wouldn't be who I am today without that incident that happened. Again, my mindset changed. And when my mindset changed, I wanted to now become a pro boxer and my mindset was I need to do something with this boxing now. And I was working, teaching boxing and I was fighting. It was too much boxing. That's why I say hats off to David, man, because David does that here. I don't know how he does that but he makes it look easy. And that's where I decided to leave. I left and that's when I was chasing my professional career. And, and that's when I was like, I'm gonna change my professional career. And while I'm chasing that, I'm gonna focus on learning cars. And that's where I made myself into working to in an automotive shop. And listen to this, no license, no experience and I was asking to work at an automotive shop. How fucking crazy is that? I have no experience, and then I don't even have a license to drive the cars I wanna work on. How the fuck was I expecting them to hire me? But my crazy ass made myself believe that I can get a job there, and I got it. When I got the job as a shop bitch, I learned the basics, I got my foot in the door, getting paid under minimum wage. I started soaking up game, learning, changed uh, who I was as far as my career in that field. And the rest was history. From there, I, I grew as a, as a technician. I in, became a service advisor to then a manager to then uh, a service manager at a dealership. And that's where everything just blew up from there as far as, as far as automotive. My boxing career went downhill when I kept hurting my right hand. Um, I was unable to continue boxing. Well, I could have. Honestly, I probably could have. But I made that decision as, well, how far am I gonna get with no team, 
my injury keep coming back and forth, my right hand. And at the time, my wife was pregnant. Um, so I decided I pursue this career job at the dealership, making great money and just let go of boxing. Or do I keep trying to gamble with this boxing? And that's not even for sure. And my dumbass took the safe route. And I went with making good money and forgot about my dream, which was fighting. It was my best friend's birthday, Halloween night. And I went out to go dancing with him. And here comes me, we're out dancing. And my homie comes up to me and says, hey, be my wingman. I'm going to go ask this girl to dance. Go dance with her friend. And, I, you know, those usually don't turn out that good. You know what I mean? I was like, ah, fuck, do I really want to do that? So I went. I walked up there, and it was my wife. I looked at her, started dancing. I was like, okay, not too bad. I could dance. Now I'm playing. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So we started dancing, and then got her number. And the funny story is, funny part about this, I actually put one digit too much on when I saved her contact. I texted her that night. She didn't text back. So when she didn't text back, three days later, I went to her contact. I edited it. I was about to delete her contact. I said, I don't want to have this girl on my phone. I deleted her contact, and I realized I had eight digits instead of seven. I deleted the last digit, texted her again, and it worked. It was her. <laughs> and boom, the rest was history, man. Now we got two kids and I'm happily married with her. When I found out my wife was pregnant, uh, she was actually not my wife yet. And I actually didn't even have uh, paperwork yet because the dream act hadn't passed. So I was still undocumented. I was working on cars, but I wasn't getting paid great. Um, I didn't really have a very bright future. And I find out I'm about to have my first kid. And for me, I knew instantly that I had to be there because I knew what it was like to not have a dad there. I knew what it was like to be raised by a single mom. All the pain that I had as a kid, I didn't want my kid to have that. I knew I wanted my life for my son, Alonso, the oldest one, to be the greatest life and the greatest childhood that I never had. I wanted him to have it. And so when I found that out, I was like, yo, whatever I gotta do to make ends meet, let's make this happen. And um, I did it. Luckily, uh, six months, eight months later, that's when, um, I think it was like six months later, that's when the DREAM Act passed. And that's when I got my paperwork. And that's when I got a great job, right when Alonso was born. So that's when my career job happened. So it was actually a blessing. All happened once at once that I was able to provide. I was gonna provide regardless, but it helped me be, get even a better job. You know what I'm saying? So I'm working at the dealership, making great money, um, over $100,000 a year. I'm working Monday through Thursday. I'm off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm living the life, or at least I think I am. 23, 24 year old, five, 25 year old, that's the life. You know what I mean? And had everything I wanted, benefits, vacation. And we're at this meeting, a regional meeting, and I have a guy tell me, and then I'm talking to all the older men, everyone in my position, and I have a guy I ask, because I always ask him questions. I ask this guy, what would you do different if you were in my shoes? Because this guy had already been in the game for like 20 years, and he told me I would get the hell out of it. He said, I would do something else because he's I'm diabetic now. I'm stressed out all the time. I'm on my sec I'm on my third divorce. I got uh I mean on my third marriage, I got divorced twice. And when he told me that it really hit home. Because at the time I was so blinded by the money and all this that I didn't think 10, 15 years down the road, where would I be health wise? Because Monday through Thursday, I was stressed the fuck out. I wasn't eating lunch because I was working all day. And if I did, I mean, I was eating lunch, but I wasn't really eating lunch where I sat down and enjoyed my lunch. I was like this on the go, you know what I'm saying? I only ate once, I was, I was busting my ass. And I did it because I, it, was, it was a big benefit to it. So I enjoyed the money out of it. 
but my health was taking a beating for it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't look at that. This guy helped me look at that. This guy woke me up and told me, son, get the fuck out of that and find something you want to do long term. When this guy told me that, I started thinking of where my heart was at, which my heart was in boxing all along. My, my heart was in teaching. My heart was in making impact in people in the same way that guy made an impact in my life in that moment. Make sense? So that's when I started saving up money, man. I started saving up money and started planning. Started laying out what I was gonna do with my business when I had the money, when I had a boxing gym. And that's when this opportunity arise. This gym was actually had a date to close its doors. They offered it to me. I took over and the rest is history. Now we're five years in. Yeah, we're on our fifth year. Uh, yeah, we're on our fifth year. And uh, we've grown so much as far as myself as a business person, myself as a coach, myself as a husband, as a parent, and as a leader. But also the gym itself, how many lives we've impacted, how many people we touched, how many competitions we won, professional and amateur, kids, everything. It just blew up traumatically. But what I tell myself at 14 years old is you have plenty of time. Um, I waited to get the ball rolling when I was 19 as far as chasing my dreams. I, it took me a few years of me being around positive people. If I would have been around those positive people at 14, maybe I would have saved me three years of my life and I would have been three years more ahead. Now at 30 years old, I can honestly say that I did a lot, but I know that all, I have time still. You know what I mean? That I'm, I'm not, I'm not, the door's not closed. So that's what I would tell myself at 14 is, you have time. Don't, uh, don't waste it. But if you do waste a few years, don't kill yourself because you wasted those years. And by kill yourself is don't beat yourself up mentally because you thought you wasted X amount of time.